Hey, hello, welcome back, my friend, to day number 304. This is another great day in God's Word where we will read Ezekiel 34 and 35, Isaiah 13, and Hebrews 9. May the Lord bless you real good today. Let's turn to Ezekiel 34. In Ezekiel yesterday, we heard of how Pharaoh was to be mocked in the world of the dead. Then we heard of God's justice, which he showed by the illustration of Ezekiel as a watchman for a city. Ezekiel 34 Heading, The Shepherds of Israel The Lord spoke to me, Mortal man! Denounce the rulers of Israel. Prophesy to them, and tell them what I, the Sovereign Lord, say to them. You are doomed, you shepherds of Israel. You take care of yourselves, but never tend the sheep. You drink the milk, wear clothes made of the wool, and kill and eat the finest sheep. But you never tend the sheep. You have not taken care of the weak ones, healed the ones that are sick, bandaged the ones that are hurt, brought back the ones that wandered off, or looked for the ones that were lost. Instead you treated them cruelly. Because the sheep had no shepherd, they were scattered, and wild animals killed and ate them. So my sheep wandered over the high hills and the mountains, They were scattered over the face of the earth, and no one looked for them or tried to find them. Now, you shepherds, listen to what I, the Lord, am telling you. As surely as I am the living God, you had better listen to me. My sheep have been attacked by wild animals that killed and ate them because there was no shepherd. My shepherds did not try to find the sheep. They were taking care of themselves and not the sheep. So listen to me, you shepherds. I, the Sovereign Lord, declare that I am your enemy. I will take my sheep away from you and never again let you be their shepherds. Never again will I let you take care only of yourselves." I will rescue my sheep from you and not let you eat them. Heading, The Good Shepherd I, the Sovereign Lord, tell you that I myself will look for my sheep and take care of them, in the same way as shepherds take care of their sheep that were scattered and are brought together again. I will bring them back from all the places where they were scattered on that dark, disastrous day. I will take them out of foreign countries, gather them together, and bring them back to their own land. I will lead them back to the mountains and the streams of Israel, and will feed them in pleasant pastures. I will let them graze in safety in the mountain meadows and the valleys and in all the green pastures of the land of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I will find them a place to rest. I, the Sovereign Lord, have spoken. I will look for those that are lost, bring back those that wander off, bandage those that are hurt, and heal those that are sick. But those that are fat and strong I will destroy, because I am the shepherd who does what is right. Now then, my flock, I, the Sovereign Lord, tell you that I will judge each of you and separate the good from the bad, the sheep from the goats. Some of you are not satisfied with eating the best grass, You even trample down what you don't eat. You drink the clear water and muddy what you don't drink. My other sheep have to eat the grass you trample down and drink the water you muddy. So now, I, the Sovereign Lord, tell you that I will judge between you strong sheep and the weak sheep. You pushed the sick ones aside and butted them away from the flock. 
but I will rescue my sheep and not let them be mistreated any more. I will judge each of my sheep and separate the good from the bad. I will give them a king like my servant David to be their one shepherd, and he will take care of them. I, the Lord, will be their God, and a king like my servant David will be their ruler. I have spoken. I will make a covenant with them that guarantees their security. I will get rid of all the dangerous animals in the land, so that my sheep can live safely in the fields and sleep in the forests. I will bless them and let them live around my sacred hill. There I will bless them with showers of rain when they need it. The trees will bear fruit, the fields will produce crops, and everyone will live in safety on his own land. When I break my people's chains and set them free from those who made them slaves, then they will know that I am the Lord. The heathen nations will not plunder them any more, and the wild animals will not kill and eat them. They will live in safety, and no one will terrify them. I will give them fertile fields and put an end to hunger in the land. The other nations will not sneer at them any more. Everyone will know that I protect Israel and that they are my people. I, the Sovereign Lord, have spoken. You, my sheep, the flock that I feed, are my people, and I am your God, says the Sovereign Lord. Ezekiel 35 Heading God's Punishment of Edom The Lord spoke to me, Mortal man, denounce the country of Edom. Tell the people what I, the Sovereign Lord, am saying. I am your enemy, mountains of Edom. I will make you a desolate wasteland. I will leave your cities in ruins and your land desolate. Then you will know that I am the Lord. You were Israel's constant enemy, and let her people be slaughtered in the time of her disaster, the time of final punishment for her sins. So then, as surely as I, the Sovereign Lord, am the living God, death is your fate, and you cannot escape it. You are guilty of murder, and murder will follow you. I will make the hill country of Edom a wasteland, and kill everyone who travels through it. I will cover the mountains with corpses, and the bodies of those who are killed in battle will cover the hills and valleys. I will make you desolate forever, and no one will live in your cities again. Then you will know that I am the Lord. You said that the two nations, Judah and Israel, together with their lands, belong to you and that you would possess them, even though I, the Lord, was their God. So then, as surely as I, the Sovereign Lord, am the living God, I will pay you back for your anger, your jealousy, and your hate toward my people." They will know that I am punishing you for what you did to them. Then you will know that I, the Lord, heard you say with contempt that the mountains of Israel were desolate and that they were yours to devour. I have heard the wild, boastful way you have talked against me. The Sovereign Lord says, I will make you so desolate that the whole world will rejoice at your downfall, just as you rejoiced at the devastation of Israel, my own possession. The mountains of Seir, yes, all the land of Edom, will be desolate. Then everyone will know that I am the Lord." Let's turn to Isaiah 13. Yesterday's reading in Isaiah was a psalm of 
praise, including these poetic lines, which I am quoting from the NLT. The Lord God is my strength and my song. He has given me victory. With joy you will drink deeply from the fountain of salvation. Tell the nations what he has done. Let them know how mighty he is. Isaiah 13 Heading, God Will Punish Babylon This is a message about Babylon, which Yesiah, son of Amos, received from God. On the top of a barren hill, raise the battle flag. Shout to the soldiers and raise your arm as a signal for them to attack the gates of the proud city. The Lord has called out his proud and confident soldiers to fight a holy war and punish those he is angry with. Listen to the noise on the mountains, the sound of a great crowd of people, the sound of nations and kingdoms gathering. The Lord of armies is preparing his troops for battle. They are coming from far-off countries at the ends of the earth. In his anger, the Lord is coming to devastate the whole country. Howl in pain, the day of the Lord is near, the day when the Almighty brings destruction. Everyone's hands will hang limp, and everyone's courage will fail. They will all be terrified and overcome with pain, like the pain of a woman in labor. They will look at each other in fear, and their faces will burn with shame. The day of the Lord is coming, that cruel day of his fierce anger and fury. The earth will be made a wilderness, and every sinner will be destroyed. Every star and every constellation will stop shining. The sun will be dark when it rises, and the moon will give no light. The Lord says, I will bring disaster on the earth and punish all wicked people for their sins. I will humble everyone who is proud and punish everyone who is arrogant and cruel. Those who survive will be scarcer than gold. I will make the heavens tremble, and the earth will be shaken out of its place on that day when I, the Lord Almighty, show my anger. The foreigners living in Babylon will run away to their homelands, scattering like deer escaping from hunters, like sheep without a shepherd. Anyone who is caught will be stabbed to death. While they look on helplessly, their babies will be battered to death. Their houses will be looted, and their wives will be raped. The Lord says, I am stirring up the Medes to attack Babylon. They care nothing for silver and are not tempted by gold. With their bows and arrows they will kill the young men. They will show no mercy to babies and take no pity on children. Babylonia is the most beautiful kingdom of all. It is the pride of its people. But I, the Lord, will overthrow Babylon as I did Sodom and Gomorrah. No one will ever live there again. No wandering Arab will ever pitch a tent there, and no shepherd will ever pasture a flock there. It will be a place where desert animals live and where owls build their nests. Ostriches will live there, and wild goats will prance through the ruins. The towers and palaces will echo with the cries of hyenas and jackals. Babylon's time has come. Her days are almost over. Let's turn now to Hebrews 9. Important conclusions from yesterday's reading include Chapter 8, verse 6 
But now Jesus has been given priestly work which is superior to theirs, just as the covenant which he arranged between God and his people is a better one, because it is based on promises of better things. Verse 13. By speaking of a new covenant, God has made the first one old, and anything that becomes old and worn out will soon disappear. Hebrews chapter 9. The first covenant had rules for worship and a place made for worship as well. A tent was put up, the outer one, which was called the holy place. In it were the lamp stand and the table with the bread offered to God. Behind the second curtain was the tent called the most holy place. In it were the gold altar for the burning of incense and the covenant box all covered with gold and containing the gold jar with the manna in it, Aaron's stick that had sprouted leaves and the two stone tablets with the commandments written on them. Above the box were the winged creatures representing God's presence with their wings spread over the place where sins were forgiven. But now is not the time to explain everything in detail. This is how those things have been arranged. The priests go into the outer tent every day to perform their duties, but the high priest goes into the inner tent, and he does so only once a year. He takes with him blood which he offers to God on behalf of himself, and for the sins which the people have committed without knowing they were sinning. The Holy Spirit clearly teaches from all these arrangements that the way into the most holy place has not yet been opened as long as the outer tent still stands. This is a symbol which points to the present time. It means that the offerings and animal sacrifices presented to God cannot make the worshipper's heart perfect, since they have to do only with food, drink, and various purification ceremonies. These are all outward rules, which apply only until the time when God will establish the new order. But Christ has already come as the high priest of the good things that are already here. The tent in which he serves is greater and more perfect. It is not a tent made by human hands, that is, it is not part of this created world. When Christ went through the tent and entered once and for all into the most holy place, he did not take the blood of goats and bulls to offer as a sacrifice, Rather, he took his own blood and obtained eternal salvation for us. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a burnt calf are sprinkled on the people who are ritually unclean, and this purifies them by taking away their ritual impurity. Since this is true, how much more is accomplished by the blood of Christ? Through the eternal Spirit, he offered himself as a perfect sacrifice to God. His blood will purify our consciences from useless rituals, so that we may serve the living God. For this reason, Christ is the one who arranges a new covenant, so that those who have been called by God may receive the eternal blessings that God has promised. This can be done because there has been a death which sets people free from the wrongs they did while the first covenant was in effect. In the case of a will, it is necessary to prove that the person who made it has died, for a will means nothing while the person who made it is alive. It goes into effect only after his death. That is why even the first covenant went into effect only with the use of blood. First, Moses proclaimed to the people all the commandments as set forth in the law. 
Then he took the blood of bulls and goats, mixed it with water, and sprinkled it on the book of the law and all the people, using a sprig of hyssop and some red wool. He said, This is the blood which seals the covenant that God has commanded you to obey. In the same way, Moses also sprinkled blood on the sacred tent and over all the things used in worship. Indeed, according to the law, almost everything is purified by blood, and sins are forgiven only if blood is poured out. Those things which are copies of the heavenly originals had to be purified in that way. But the heavenly things themselves require much better sacrifices. For Christ did not go into a holy place made by human hands, which was a copy of the real one. He went into heaven itself, where he now appears on our behalf in the presence of God. The Jewish high priest goes into the most holy place every year with the blood of an animal, but Christ did not go in to offer himself many times, for then he would have had to suffer many times ever since the creation of the world. Instead, now when all ages of time are nearing the end, he appeared once and for all, to remove sin through the sacrifice of himself. Everyone must die once, and after that be judged by God. In the same manner, Christ also was offered in sacrifice once to take away the sins of many. He will appear a second time not to deal with sin, but to save those who are waiting for him. Let's approach our God now in prayer. Heavenly Father and our Savior, Christ Jesus, thank you for the new covenant and that you have arranged an eternal salvation for us. We wonder at all the complex detail in which rituals for purification from sin were established and practiced through the ages. You carefully were teaching and symbolically proclaiming how a more permanent and perfect salvation would work. Thank you that that perfect salvation is already here. Our high priest accomplished the fulfillment with his own blood. His sacrifice is perfect, needing to be done only once and extending to all peoples and for all times. Instead of ritual purification where animal blood and water was sprinkled on people's bodies, our high priest made the one perfect sacrifice that even purifies our consciences. Now, If our consciences are not clean, it's time to ask your forgiveness. And receiving your forgiveness, now we may boldly come before the throne of the living God, who we now call our Father, to present our praises and our prayers. <laughs> 